Okay. Uh, yeah, we're delighted to be here. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I, w I will admit at the outset that we do also feel slightly, a little bit like frauds being here, because I'm pretty sure that what we actually offered to do uh, was to do a, a fill-in talk, you know, if there was any shortage of offers of talks for the conference. And, and having looked at the programme, there's very obviously no shortage of amazing sounding talks. So I don't quite know why we're here, but we'll certainly do our best. Um, we also apologise a little bit if the title makes it sound yeah, like... Sue, get nearer to the mic. Get nearer to the microphone. Can everybody hear me OK? <laughs> OK, right. Um, yes, yeah, so we also want to apologise if, if it makes it sound like we have any... Um, we feel like we have any remit to kind of talk about community heritage in Scotland in general, because we very obviously don't. You know, we're, we're just one community group, uh, and we're no more qualified to talk about community heritage than any of the other thousands of active community groups across Scotland at the moment. Um, so let, please put the emphasis on the personal part of the title. Um, it, it's just, uh, you know, every group could write their own talk along these lines and, and there would be lots of similarities, but everybody group, every group would have their own kind of novel ideas and experiences as well. Um, we're just like a case study, if you like, for some of the things that the community heritage sector has been getting up to in Scotland over the last decade or so. Um, so when we started putting the talk together, we kind of wondered, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to um, explain our journey through community heritage over the last however many years? And we thought about trendy concepts like logic models, uh, you know, how you get from A to B, and all the things you have to do in between to get there. And then we thought, but that would have given a very, um, a very misleading impression of our journey through community heritage, because that would suggest that we've been quite organised about it, and we definitely haven't. We've been a very illogical model by that kind of analogy. Um, so we thought ours, ours would be much more like an evolutionary tree. Um, you know, you kind of plant a little seed and then your tree grows. Uh, it might get a dose of fertiliser along the way or it might get some nasty disease. And all those things kind of influence the, the sort of size and shape that your tree turns out in the end. Uh, we also had a, a, quite a, um, an entertaining diversion the other evening, trying to decide uh, who and what the, the fertiliser and the diseases to our tree had been. But um, we, we didn't kind of know who was going to be the audience, so we thought we should probably better keep that to ourselves. So I'm um, not going to talk about that. Um, but essentially, you, you know, you kind of start with whatever you've got and you just build on it and you're influenced as, you, as your journey progresses by uh, yourself, you know, your own skills, your own limitations and by the other people and different influences that, that you kind of come across along the way. Um, and on that line, quite an important lesson for us, I think, we gave a talk once to a community group about a project that involved quite a lot of different aspects. You know, we'd done documentary stuff and uh, excavations, we'd done lots of things with the local primary school, drama, art, all that kind of thing. Um, and, and somebody, we were, we were horrified. Somebody came up to us at the end, and apart from saying they'd really enjoyed our talk, which obviously wasn't horrifying, they said that, that they'd been really intimidated. They felt that the project had included so many things that they could never contemplate starting doing anything like that. Um, you know, and the whole point of the talk had been to encourage people to do things. He said, if we can do these things, we've got no kind of formal heritage or archaeology background. You know, if we can do this, anybody can do it. Um, but I think in our, our kind of eternal enthusiasm, uh, we, we hadn't bothered to point out or to stress about um, how kind of haphazard, if you like, and opportunistic our approach to, to kind of community heritage had been. You just kind of, um, yeah, you just kind of do things as they come along. You don't have any great plan about it. So basically, you don't really need to know where you're going to end up when you start, because wherever you go and whichever route you take, you're going to end up somewhere and you're going to achieve something by the end of it. Um, OK, so we, we thought we'd just share a little bit of our evolutionary journey with you, you know, and talk a little bit about some of the diversions along the way, um, some of the things we've learned, good things and bad things. Uh, some of the things that we've uh, that we've argued about along the way, quite a lot of those as well, um, and just you know maybe a few thoughts from our perspective about how it might possibly all fit into the bigger picture. Um, so we started thinking, well, when did we start doing this? Because say neither of us got a background in this kind of thing at all, and we reckoned it started about 2003, uh, which was when we met each other at the local playgroup with our kids. Um, and, um, you know, by that stage, I think we were both sitting there wondering if we'd actually got any brain cells left. And, and talking about the weekend's Time Team episode uh, was, was a lot more interesting than worrying about whether it was OK to let your child eat cheesy watsits or looking to see if they trashed somebody else's Lego creation over in the corner. Um, and we kind of progressed from that. So we started, you know, going out and taking our kids on walks round 
all sorts of places, you know, quite long walks in all weather. Uh, and some of those walks ended up being behind the hill, up the hill behind Fiona's house. Um, and in retrospect, it's quite difficult now to think back and imagine there was ever a time when I hadn't heard of Highmore Lagan. Uh, and this is Highmore Lagan, or this is what's left of Highmore Lagan at the moment. Um, and we often reflect on what it was about those ruins and why it was that we decided we wanted to find out more about them. Was it just a, an academic exercise because we wanted to sort of exercise what remaining brain cells we did have? Or was there something, you know, a bit more fundamental to it than that? Um, indeed, you know, had we actually realised where this journey was going to leave, uh, lead us, would, would we have carried on? Or would we have sort of run back down the hill and barricaded ourselves in the house and not come out again? Uh, and I don't, don't kind of know the answer to that in, in retrospect. Um, but after a lot of discussion and probably several glasses of wine the other day, uh, we decided that a sense of place was, of course, a really important motivation for us. And we're glad to see that lots of other major organisations, uh, including HS, you know, agree that that is an important thing. Uh, that motivates people. Um, it then took us probably several more glasses of wine, I don't know, to agree, you know, what the heck is a sense of place? And we did eventually, amongst the many, you know, the great literature on it and the many quotations you can find, we came up with this quote by an American consultant, Thomas Woods, uh, and he said, a sense of place emerges through knowledge of the history, geography and geology of the area, its flora and fauna, the legends of a place and a growing sense of the land and its history. And we kind of thought, OK, yeah, well, we can both agree with that. But then you think a bit more and you think, well, you know, but that still doesn't say anything about the people and it still doesn't say anything about the buildings. So basically, a sense of place is an incredibly personal thing. It, you know, it's whatever gives you personally an emotional connection uh, to the place where you live and a sense of belonging and that doesn't matter you know if you've lived there for all your life and you were born there or even if you're you know quite a recent incomer that dreaded dreaded word um, so we never really had any great plans at that stage about what we wanted to do we just knew that we were curious we wanted to find out more about Mulligan about the buildings and about the people who used to live there so at that stage we think okay the obvious thing we'll go and join the local heritage group so we went along to the local heritage group um, but we found that that was very much focused on sort of reminiscing about old photographs and things and being incomers to the area. We didn't have any sort of local reminiscences or memories to contribute. Uh, and we also found it was a wee bit sort of maybe sedentary for our liking. So we sort of went off and decided we'd do our own thing and channel our inner time team. Uh, so we found out as much as we could about Mulag and just using the internet and the library. We signed up for a couple of adult education courses, one at Glasgow and Strathclyde Unis, which had the advantage that we got away from our families for a whole evening a week, which was quite, quite an achievement at that stage. Um, and then we start, and we volunteered on a, quite a wide range of archaeological excavations, including several up at um, Kilmartin Museum. Um, but then I think a major turning point for us was we managed to escape from our families for an entire week uh, and we went on an excavation training course down with York Archaeological Trust, um, which was, was brilliant. You know, I think it really opened our eyes and opened up a, a whole new world of possibilities to us. Um, some people in the room might, might not believe this, but at, at that, you know, round about that time, I think we were one of those kind of seldom heard voices. You know, we were mums with young children, people who were probably not traditionally involved in sort of active heritage things and archaeological activities. Um, but I think surprisingly for us, our children were, they were probably one of those fertilisers for our tree because they, they brought us together in the first place, but also because we were we were stay-at-home mums. We both worked, but with flexible working hours, you know, so we had the time and we had the motivation to, to get ourselves together to do some of these things. Uh, it did require a lot of creative timetabling, but, um, you know, it, it was possible. Um, but having said that, I mean, I think we, we, we do fully appreciate uh, that we did have a bit of a, a head start, you know, we white professional middle-class background. Um, and I think, obviously, when you look at kind of including people in heritage activities, there are lots more hurdles that need to be overcome to broaden the inclusion in that sort of thing um, even further. Um, you know, whether they be physical barriers, whether they be financial barriers. Ah, what, what is happening? Okay, um, okay. yeah, so... so I, I, as I was saying, uh, we think that you know, there, are, there are obviously lots of other barriers to be overcome to try and increase uh, inclusion of people in various heritage activities. Um, and kind of looking at a quick 
reflection, if you like, on this kind of stage of our journey, our evolutionary journey. And I do have very vivid images of uh, our kids at that time. One of them sitting under a space blanket in the middle of a graveyard in the middle of winter one year. Uh, and another one, you know, a, a, the illustration you have here, we, we used to force them to go on long walks in appalling weather conditions because we were determined to go and look at some ruins somewhere. Uh, and I think a lot of people, possibly our children, might have thought we were just a little bit too single-minded at that point. But I, I don't think they've suffered too much from it um, in the end. So another completely unplanned step in our evolutionary journey, if you like, was coming across this project based in Edinburgh um, that uh, project professed to be prepared to send someone out to visit us in deepest, darkest Argyle to help us uh, record the ruins of our settlement up at High Morlagen. Um, so, you know, thanks to Ishbel and Tersha and all the rest of the SRP team. Um, SRP, I think, was definitely responsible for inspiring us and for boosting our confidence. Um, and, and, very critically, for teaching us how to produce things like this. This, this was a plan of our settlement in Morlagan, which we were, and indeed still are, you know, really quite, quite pleased with. Um, SRP also uh, managed to persuade us to give a presentation at one of their conferences, and we remember finishing off that presentation with a slide uh, that had a, a, what we thought was a joke at the end, maybe it wasn't a joke, saying that we wanted somebody to give us money so that we could go and excavate our settlement, which at that time was maybe slightly, you know, quite an unusual idea, um, but obviously it wasn't as much as a joke as we, we thought it might have been. Uh, and we do often look and wonder, you know, what, what was it about SRP that did work very well for us? And I think there were several things. Uh, one was definitely having uh, some uh, friendly faces um, there who were prepared to come and, you know, help us and give us advice without making us feel like idiots. You know, even if they did think we were idiots, they, they were obviously very tactful about it and didn't bother to tell us. Uh, and it, it was being part of a big network of projects, so we could share ideas and we could share experiences. And it was also knowing that the, whatever results we produced were, were valuable and were actually contributing to a, a you know a, a national database. So I think we felt empowered. We definitely felt empowered, not in any sort of confrontational way. We just felt that we you know very much more our, our confidence was greatly improved by the whole experience. To be brutally honest, I think you know up until this point. You know, anything we'd done, it was purely because we were interested in it. We hadn't really thought about including other people in what we were doing. Uh, and in fact, I don't think we, it ever occurred to us anybody else to be interested in what we were doing. Uh, and it was only after we'd been to that SRP conference that we kind of got the feedback and got the idea that other people might actually want to join in. You know, they might want to help with our, our campaign to excavate the ruins at Time or Lagan. So... You know, we decided we'd pursue that idea. But having volunteered with, on archaeological digs, it, you know, we knew perfectly well that um, uh, we couldn't just go and dig things. You, you know, there was no way that we were ever going to remember all of the technical complexities of recording and levelling and you know, how to tell the difference between greeny brown and browny green, sandy silt and silty sand and all the rest of that. You know, we, we didn't want to go down that route. So instead, we, we became constituted. We formed the Morlagan Rural Settlement Group because we knew that was then going to allow us to apply for funding that meant we could em employ people who did know how to do all those things, uh, which seems like a much better strategy to us. Um, so between 2009 and 2014, we ran kind of a variety of community heritage projects. We started off with a, one at Highmore Lagan um, that cost about £15,000 of, uh, of funds. And then we moved on to a second season, uh, costing 30000 And then ultimately we ended up with the, um, the, the Hidden Heritage Project, which was funded to the tune of about 90000 And we kind of like to think, oh, you know, that's a nice, a nice funding curve. Can we kind of keep extrapolating that? Uh, sadly, it doesn't necessarily seem to work that way. But, uh, but we'll see, anyway. Um, somebody, somebody once described one of our projects or their experience of one of our projects as being relaxed but professional. And I think that was probably the best compliment anyone could ever have paid us, really. Um, we always wanted to make sure that people who joined in our projects had fun. And, and us as well. I mean, we wanted to have fun. Um, partly because you do anyway, but also it, it seems to be really important because that's the best way, I think, if people go away with good memories about a place and good experiences, then they're going to be, want to be, they're going to be much more likely to care about what happens to that place in the future uh, and to be interested in, in its preservation and its conservation. 
Uh, but, you know, having said that, of course we wanted to find things out as well. We wanted to have fun, but we did want to actually find out what was going on in our settlement at Highmore Lagan, uh, and to make sure that whatever we did find out was recorded rigorously, because we wanted to make sure that, you know, the professional archaeology, archaeology community would take, our, take us seriously and take our results seriously as well. Um, so we commissioned... Uh, professionals from Kilmartin Museum, from Argyle Archaeology, from Northlight Heritage, at various points throughout uh, the projects to manage the actual excavations. Uh, but then we also procured a variety of specialist services to do things like um, post-excavation analysis and environmental analysis, um, as well as trying to um, develop skills and engage people who weren't maybe particularly interested in the actual digging, strange people that they were, um, you know, but we, we offered various things like clay pipe making workshops and theatre drama workshops, uh, documentary research, a, you know, a wide range of things to try and tap into lots of different interests along the way. And we were particularly keen to get the primary school involved. Um, you know, so we ended up sourcing a few little extra bits of funding so that we could immerse them effectively in the project. So they did, we did some drama reenactment. This is actually at Ockendre Museum doing some theatre um, stuff there. Uh, and we did poetry, we did art stuff, we did Gaelic singing, storytelling, Viking reenactments, and of course we did digging and that as well. Um, uh, and with, with you know, kind of those ideas in mind, we have always felt that it was crucial to try and interpret heritage in as many different ways and through as many different media as possible until you, you know, until you hit on one that the people can actually relate to. Um, so that, that's kind of the theory behind the various different approaches that we've taken. Um, I mean, this was a really busy and exciting time for us, and I think we got almost quite in intoxicated by seeing other people getting inspired and excited by the archaeology and, you know, and by the past in general. Um, and in many respects, you know, it was easy to get people involved. In primary schools, loads of adults, that really wasn't the problem. Uh, but we did also want to get the secondary schools involved, because that seems like a really crucial age to be trying to capture people's interest at. Um, and, you know, and, and I think maybe naively you kind of think of oh, the curriculum for excellence you know the sort of cross-subject working it ought to be quite easy to get people secondary school kids involved but I think looking back in retrospect we felt we really only had a kind of token involvement from the secondary schools because the logistics are just they're, they're just enormous you know we have huge schools 1400 children the numbers involved the parallel classes the transport logistics and expenses and just pressures of exams all kind of made things more complicated than we kind of hoped that they would have been, really. Um, and looking carefully back at projects that we do feel seem to have engaged really well with secondary school children, uh, with secondary school kids, you know, we think that maybe a, a longer term approach, a more insider approach, so that really what you should be targeting is not the secondary school children, but it should be the, the, the teachers at the secondary school. You need a much more um, inside based approach to get to it. Um, and then on reflection and, and kind of looking, as we said, trying to look at the bigger picture, uh, we reckon, you know, that in trying to instill a sense of place in our young people through the education system really should be quite a fundamental aim of, of you know, any sort of future heritage projects. And there's obviously a fair amount of discussion to be had about how is the best way to implement that. Uh, but definitely something that, that's worth trying to think about, I think. So what else did we learn? Well, we discovered that we, as a community group, could decide what heritage sites are going to be investigated, which opened up a whole new world of possibilities to us, I think. You know, our, our experience of community archaeology up to that point had been very positive in, in, in every respect, but, but very different. You know, we'd volunteered on... Um, <coughs> and contributed to projects organised by lots of different uh, professional organisations. Uh, but now, you know, we were expecting the professionals to contribute to projects that we'd identified and that we were organising. Um, I think it's absolutely fair to say that that was probably quite a mutual learning curve on our part. Uh, maybe we occasionally felt slightly patronised by professionals, but then maybe we were just, maybe just a little bit oversensitive about that, I don't know. Uh, but I do certainly remember one unnamed archaeologist from Argyle who managed to reduce Fiona to tears on at least one occasion. <laughs> um, I'm sure the archaeologists would have a whole different slant on this as well. I'm, I'm sure they were extremely frustrated on many occasions by you know, the community perspectives and the community priorities, but you'd obviously have to, you'd have to ask their version of that, I think. 
Um, and we think the important thing is just to maintain some sort of mutual respect. You've got to recognise that both parties bring completely different and complementary um, skills to the table, you know, whether it be pro professional archaeological skills or whether it just be local knowledge. And, and then local people bring another whole range of you know, quite unanticipated skills along with them as well. So it's all led to lots of debates on our part, again, about you know, what, what does constitute community archaeology. Uh, and I know, you know, I know there's loads of literature on this, but we kind of thought, well, from our perspective, you know, because we've been involved in community archaeology now on all sorts of different levels. Uh, and I think our conclusion, for what that's worth, you know, was that it encompasses models with a whole range of amateur and professional relationships, uh, all of which are absolutely perfectly valid and, and have a, a place in the bigger picture. Because let's face it, you know, one size doesn't fit all, so there's no point in pretending that it's ever going to. Uh, you know, whether it's volunteering for a day on a dig organised by another organisation or whether it's identifying a site and applying for the funding and managing the whole thing yourself or what, indeed whether it's anything in between they're all uh, absolutely perfectly great and it's basically it's whatever, whatever works for you however helps you best to engage with your, your local heritage you know, maybe it'd be helpful to distinguish between them with terms like community participation as opposed to community-led archaeology I don't know, you know, that's does it matter? It's just kind of a thought. Um, I'm going to pass you over to Fiona now, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about how our experiences might fit into the bigger picture. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So um, that's the whistle stop tour of our evolution so far appropriately delivered by the biologist, Sue. Um, and I'm now going to get really boring, so please don't fall asleep. I'm going to talk about some, some of the strategic issues that we've been thinking about. Eve told us, what did she say? Um, we could be challenging, but not rude. Um, so here goes. <laughs> we want to talk a bit about funding. Applying for funding was really daunting for us. Our main chunks of funding has all, have always come from HL, Heritage Lottery Fund, HLF, and leader. I mean, where on earth would we be without HLF? I don't know. But HLF aside, we found accessing other sources of funding, you know, incredibly time consuming and complicated. Different funders' eligibility criteria, the cash flow nightmare. Um, you don't know how many times I woke up in the middle of the night in a very, very hot sweat worrying about bloody leader and claiming processes. Horrible stuff. And I've no idea where some funders expect communities, you know, to um, run projects when there's no money up front, you know, we don't have any funds. Uh, Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park Authority, they took a risk on us um, and seed funded the High Moor Lagan project um, from their natural heritage grant, unusually. Um, maybe this was another dose of manure to our evolutionary tree, not saying that the National Park you know, talks a load of crap or anything, but you know, just in case. Our hidden heritage project was also would never have seen the light of day if Northlight Heritage hadn't had the vision and the money and to put its money where it, its mouth was um, to fund the time for a local person to develop a proposal um, and to apply for the funding. They recognised the importance um, of development time, of local knowledge when designing a project that was about um, engaging with the local community. Um, we do recognise that money is limited and in order to distribute it, organisations have to have their own criteria to reflect their priorities. But maybe this sometimes misses the opportunity to fund sort of innocent, risky projects. I'm not sure how we rectify this. So our focus has mainly been project funding and communities need stimulation and support and flexible funding to allow kind of grassroots ideas to get off the ground. But we all know here that there's increasing reliance on communities to deliver services um, and to support... I don't think I've been changing slides, have I? Have I been changing slides? I haven't been changing slides, so you're supposed to remind me about things like this. Um, <laughs> I've got blue lines to when I'm supposed to click, and I haven't been clicking, I just want to talk. Um, so I think I might be on this, this one, this one, I'm not sure I'm on. Um, our focus has been on project funding and communities need stimulation, support and flexibility. Um, but we know about this increasing reliance on communities to deliver services and own and run heritage assets. 
But it can't just be the case of passing the buck. They need help with business planning and identifying sources of money to make it sustainable income generation. Um, also, you know, how can volunteers be expected to do all this, as well as doing their day jobs, whether it's changing nappies or being, I don't know, chief exec of HES? We need to accept that it's okay for a community to get funding to employ people to deliver their ideas sometimes. And this doesn't stop it from being community controlled. I mean, who do you think's in control in this situation? I definitely think it's me with the red flags. And I'm clearly taking control of the archaeologist who seems to be going in totally the wrong direction. I don't know what she's doing. So, Sue and I have loads of discussions and arguments. We have arguments all the time about lots of things. And sometimes we just can't keep our opinions to ourselves. I'm sorry. Ever since we first started investigating high moral lagging, we've been curious to know um, how research priorities are identified. In an era of limited resources, who decides what's important? I've no doubt that if you surveyed the local people in our community, they'd think that the derelict torpedo range was much more important than the recently discovered Neolithic segmented ditches at the head of the lock. So we're delight we were delighted when Historic Environment Scotland initiated the What's Your Heritage consultation. But we do hope that this culture of listening to the public becomes the normal way of developing policy and funding priorities. Though we do appreciate that significant resources will be needed to work out who to listen to, when to listen to them, how to hear them, and what to do with the results. So talking about priorities, we also had input into the recent uh, Regional Archaeological Research Framework for Argyle. Wow, that's a mouthful. For us, it raised the issue of academic versus community priorities. It kind of comes back to the idea of mutual respect again, I think. Of course, amateurs should appreciate that the professional um, the professionals who've dedicated like most of their lives to researching a subject know lots about it and are aware of the knowledge gaps. However, the same professionals should recognise that the amateurs or you know people who are professionals in other fields, I'd like to say, have specific local knowledge and valid opinions, and that the future of heritage research and conservation relies on their wider public engagement and support. For example, the Heimor Lagen excavation um, wasn't really designed to fill uh, an academic research gap. It was done because the community wanted to find out more um, about the nearby ruins and the people who'd lived there. Um, the project kind of brought the remains of a small hillside settlement vividly um, back to life for the whole community, deepening the sense of place, developing skills, raising awareness of heritage um, and, and in the landscape, and generating you know, potential economic benefits. So, are these community benefits good enough reasons to, um, in order to justify carrying out a project? And as it happens, actually, the excavation did unexpectedly fill a knowledge gap in relation to the post-medieval and industrial <coughs> pottery industry in Scotland. Because after analysing, I think, something like um, 13,181 shards of pottery, we're really proud of that, um, from the excavation, pottery expert George Haggerty, here in the picture, described the project findings as a beacon of light in a dark room. <coughs> and you should have seen his face when we turned up with ten bread trays full of pottery shards. He tried very hard that um, afternoon to wriggle out of his contract with us, um, but we controlled that situation too. And anyone who knows George knows that's quite, quite a feat trying to control George Haggerty, um, George, whatever his name is, yeah, Haggerty. So, Freeman and Tilden perfectly sums up for us, um, through interpretation, understanding, through understanding, appreciation, and through appreciation, protection. I'm sure everybody knows that, that very famous quote. We've always tried to make our results um, widely um, available as possible on the basis that there's no point doing stuff if, if nobody knows it's been done. Um, and we've given a lot, lot of talks um, about the projects over the last few years, probably about, I don't know, 50 in the last count. Uh, 
And we, we've tried to keep people informed all the time, keeping them engaged about what's happening and what's been found or not been found. And with that in mind, we've recently been trying to get funding for a project aimed at disseminating loads of heritage and archaeological information for the area around Loch Lomond, which is where we, we live, um, via dramatic or aerial film and virtual reconstructions um, and through an interactive website portal. Um, some of the information would be gathered from our project and what we found out and from um, other kind of like national records and local other local archaeological investigations. And it kind of frustrates us that although there's still loads to find out, that what's already known doesn't really reach as, reach as wide an audience as possible, um, particularly among local communities and maybe tourists. The project planned to talk to the whole range of community groups, health and social care groups, um, services, schools, businesses, to hear what heritage was important to them and feed their priorities into the online resource. Um, and we also aim to highlight the economic potential of local heritage to the local business um, and tourism sector. Um, not sure if you've heard about HLF's Great Place Scheme. It aims to support the, and promote the social and environmental and economic impacts of heritage sector, which is very much what our project aimed to do, though we thought of it a heck of a long time before um, the Great Place Scheme was launched, just wanted to make that point, um, which meant that we were even more miffed, actually, when we've just been turned down by HLF. Um, but we have a cunning plan, um, so watch this space. Another thing that's kept rearing its head in relation to, dissemin to dissemination is the idea of who owns heritage information. If professionals carry out an excavation, whether research or developer funded, what should happen to the results? Um, of course they did the work and may want to publish the results, of course, but should there be some statutory requirement for the, for the results or at least a summary of them to be made available to the public? especially in a really accessible format um, after a certain length of time. We feel that this should be enshrined in the archaeological culture rather than relying on extra funding or the terms of a specific contract. Contractors, whoever they are, should understand that they have a, a moral obligation, really, to include money to publicise the findings and the commissioning bodies should be penalised, we reckon, in some way, um, if they don't follow through with that. And when we say publicised, we mean in inaccessible ways. I mean, a case in point for us is one close to our hearts, um, which involves the potentially internationally significant results from the developer-funded Mid-Ross excavations that took place between 2003 and 5 in advance of the development of the Carrick Golf Course on the shores of Loch Lomond. No organisation appears to be taking ownership of getting these results published, and we, the community, wait sort of powerless, really, and with bated breath for information that could be, um, have really good um, community benefits that are far-reaching. Anyhow, you'll remember we talked about um, why we first got involved in community heritage, and I think what we worked out is because of our sense of place. Well, I guess it still is, but things have kind of crystallised a bit more over the years, um, and I think our reasons um, also sort of reflect the emerging kind of place-based approach to community and spatial planning that's, that's um, on the agenda at the moment. We do it because we're proud of our place and our heritage, and we want others to know about that, um, to appreciate it and to care for it and protect it. Um, because we want to tell people about the wonders of archaeology, um, reading the landscape in a different way and what it can reveal to us. We also do it, I think, because we want to hear what the locals and others say about um, what they know and their stories about the local area. And because, I guess, despite living in a national park, um, our wee village is still struggling economically and our cultural heritage could be such a, a useful tool to enrich the experiences of the thousands of many millions of visitors that come to the, climb the cobbler um, every summer um, and winter actually um, and then leave or who pass by, pass through on their way to the Western Isles and the Highlands. Don't worry, we're nearly finished. So, What's community heritage all about, anyway? Well, since our, since our first naive foray into the heritage world, nearly 15 years ago, I reckon it is, 
it became pretty integral to our daily lives, as Sue's um, described. I guess we're, we are an example of community empowerment, um, but we just hope that the bodies advocating this empowerment are ready to deal with the consequences. Um, so to help us um, understand how it all fits into the bigger picture, we came across kind of an article the other day um, uh, produced by an organisation called the RSA, which is some kind of think tank on, on public and social policy. Um, it defined um, a social movement, um, which in our case I reckon is community archaeology, uh, community heritage, um, defined it as a collective, organised, sustained and non-institutional challenge to authorities. It suggested that whilst creating energy within society, such challenges can sometimes be negative, um, uh, and, and uh, you know uh, they can be sort of confrontational and, 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 and produce sort of negative feelings. But it also suggested what it was trying to su support was that this energy could be harnessed um, by actively trying to make these interactions positive. Um, maybe that's the challenge, knowing how to bring the various players together by constructive interactions to channel the energy into positive actions. Not sure how the Vikings um, ever sort of felt that was necessary, really. But so we've rambled on far too long. And as I said at the beginning, our journey through community heritage um, was never really planned. The evolutionary tree has grown and developed some, even some new branches where folk have moved on and produced a place name book. Um, they've developed their career further, they've uh, decided to take up an archaeology degree and even looked into developing a heritage centre. We're still, we're still on that long road. Um, and apart from those tangible effects, we very much hope that actively encouraging involvement in heritage in our community has strengthened people's sense of place. Um, and you know, and has, has sort of developed a community spirit, as well as shedding the occasional light, um, you know, beacon of light in a dark room, or whatever. So that's our evolutionary journey so far, and we haven't finished yet. Um, but we have had a ball, um, and what, but what's really exciting about all of this is that we're just one of thousands of active community heritage groups across Scotland many of which are here today and doing loads more than we're doing, um, and every one of them could tell a very similar um, but different story. So if you multiply our impacts by several thousand, all of those individual evolutionary stories can add up to a revolution. Thanks for listening.